Are you ready for some Jersey? Well, we've got Jersey. The zipper was made here. The light bulb was made here. The color television calls the Garden State home. Everybody wants to know about New Jersey. Sandy beaches, beautiful cities. We even have the Jersey Turnpike. Inventors, music, the movies. You need an exit? We got them too. You want Jersey? This is Jersey. Welcome to this edition of This is Jersey. Our guest today is world-renowned juggler and acrobatic artist Michael Motion. Michael has been performing for over 40 years and is particularly known for innovations in contact juggling. He is scheduled to give a lecture and demonstration on creativity at the New Jersey City University on March 29th, and he's here to give us some insight into his exceptional career. So Michael, you're known internationally. How did you get started in this whole juggling thing? You're scaring me. I'm known internationally. Um, yeah, my work is known internationally. Um, I started juggling after I had an athletic career as a child. You were I, a wanted, golfer. Like, I wanted to be a professional golfer. That was the first thing I ever had was a, a golf club in my hand. And those were my dreams. Those are the sort of the guys that I looked up to. But I did play all the other major sports and a lot of minor ones. But what I realized was that my hand-eye coordination was something I really enjoyed in all the sports. So as far as getting started juggling, something that doesn't seem to happen nowadays, at least with the digital world, um, when I grew up, I'm that old, that we got bored. Okay, so when you get bored, what do you do? Well, we went to the library. Actually, my best friend, Penn of Penn & Teller, went to the library with my brother and got a book on juggling. They brought it home and we thought this was the most difficult thing in the world. And we just kept working, reading, seeing what simple skills we could try. They were all hard. We didn't have a teacher. We read out of a book and then figured it out with the diagrams. And it opened up a whole different way of thinking and a whole different world. And we were terrible. We were terrible for a long time. That's OK. That's good. You know, because you, when you start learning, and this is me talking later, when you learn skill stuff, so much of the time, you get in your own way and by accepting the fact that you're terrible you can then listen more closely and refine your hunger to be more perceptive of the things you should learn and being self-taught I have that independent streak of wanting to teach myself things that actually is what led to juggling instead of being a hobby being something that you know I'm pretty good at it and I can teach myself new things and I can explore the arts, I can explore movement, I can join the Big Apple Circus, I can work with great Russian acrobats, I can, you know, it just opened up the possibilities for me. Now Michael, what age were you during this whole process, in the early well, days? Well, uh, coincidentally, uh, I moved next door to Penn and that was the time that we all of a sudden just got even closer and the whole juggling thing started. We learned unicycle riding, knife throwing, fire eating. At we 11. Learned, we, yeah, 11, 12, 13. And our parents were very trusting that we were trying stuff that was a little kooky, but they, at least they knew where we were. Okay. So. so at what point did you figure you can do this for a living or did you get paid for your first Well, no, no. The, the way it works, at least the way it worked for me was we did terrible stuff for a long time, you know, and we did it in nursing homes, Boy Scout troops, whatever. Um, and then my brother and Penn actually hooked up, and they were a pair. They did some television. Um, I went off to do ceramics because that was my other love, doing ceramics. Penn went to Ringling Clown College. My brother went off and ended up with IBM. Penn asked me if we wanted to put together a team, so Penn and I, for three years, were a club passing duet. And we worked at Great Adventure, which is now Six Flags. And then Penn wanted to go on and do other stuff. And I wanted to go and try to do a little more physical kinds of stuff. So I ended up coming to New York. And then I went to dance classes, went to circus arts classes, gymnastics, Tai Chi, all different kinds of movement classes. And then I was hooked. And then luckily, I managed to know somebody who knew Paul Binder, who started the Big Apple Circus just when that was starting up. So what years are we talking about here? We're 1977, okay. something like that. And the previous year, I had been a street performer here in New York, and also the most, the, when you say international, no, the first international experience I had was going up to Montreal during the 1976 Olympics and performing in old Montreal. Oh, 
I fell in love with sort of the romance of the whole thing. It was great. Um, coming back to New York, being with the Big Apple Circus, getting to work with great people who were great artists, set me up. And also, you know, the Big Apple Circus was a unique form, small circus in big New York. We got a lot of press, so and I was doing a lot of movement stuff at the time. So I ended up being asked to be in some dance company pieces, uh, one at City Center, one at uh, other theaters. And all of a sudden, things started moving where I could dream about doing different kind of work. The other, the other part of this, okay, I'm very, I love history, I love mathematics, I love science. So I do a lot of studying. That influences my work. In New York, I would go to bookstores and also go to Lincoln Center Library and study the history of theater, the history of movement arts, whatever. I also then flew to Berlin and went to the juggling archive and learned about the history of juggling. That's, for me, the legitimizing way of going about it because I'm in a small subculture. Small subcultures have their own legitimacy, but the, the greater world, the greater arts, they have their pedigrees of this and that. If you're in a small subculture like juggling, you've got to know what's real and what's not and what's BS and what's the real thing. In all of that, um, I was lucky. The greatest juggler, as far as I'm concerned, who ever lived, Francis Brunn, came to the Big Apple Circus, saw my work, and we became best friends. Um, this much older man, who was a great, great juggler, really inspired me through conversations. My work is nothing like his. It's about as opposite as you can get, but we could converse about both the history and what I was trying to do and what he was doing, and it was great. When we return, we'll continue our conversation with Michael Motion and learn about one of his most well-known routines. But first, let's take a look at some of his famous contact juggling. Welcome back to This Is Jersey. Today our guest is juggler and performer Michael Motion, who is lecturing and demonstrating at New Jersey City University on March 29th. Here is a sample of his famous triangle routine.
The, the triangle thing, where that did that the come from? The triangle, where did that come from? Well, do you want the real story or do you want the press story? I want the real story. Okay. Well, no, really, because I don't think realistically in the hist when you read the histories of various disciplines, you usually get secondhand knowledge. Very seldom do you get firsthand knowledge. Yes, the triangle is a geometric shape that I explore with balls. It's a percussion piece. It didn't start out that way. It started out being just having wedges under doors and trying to figure out how the wedge works. Studying wedges from ancient Egypt and, and the like, figuring out how they work. Then I leaned them together and I glued them together and I made a little triangle, a little triangle. And I had a little ball and I put it inside the triangle, nothing happened. But then I put the triangle inside some circular wheel rims and rolled it, and it just rolled, and it went bum bum. One noise, two noises, bum bum. And it was like a heartbeat. And I swore, and because I knew what it meant. I knew there was a piece there that I could develop. So then it took two years to go from that tiny little triangle to building bigger triangles and bigger, and learning how to bounce balls inside those, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I had a triangle set, and then finally to get to the big one. Had anyone ever done that before? Well, no. And I, again, claiming to be the first of, I'm, I've been the first in my field in a lot of ways, in doing a lot of things. Yes, I was the first to do anything like the triangle. But artists work with the materials they have at the time. And the balls that you use for juggling for years have been lacrosse balls. And they're very hard rubber. A couple of chemists made silicon balls, which have much more spring and also much more grip. That's what enabled me to explore doing the triangle, was the material of that against the plywood, against right. the wood. So you, you commissioned that? No. Or they were already made? Oh, no, no, I made them. And, made them. But I also collaborated with a great sculptor, a friend of mine, um, John Kahn, who made the triangles that I used. But he and I sort of made them together, and he would make things that I asked for. We sort of collaborated back and forth. So did, was that the impetus of leading your career to getting a lot of TV? Well, it certainly got me a lot of corporate gigs. Okay. Okay. Yes, it's a lot enjoyable. of TV as well. Well, see, and the reason I say about my work is known different places, whether I am or not, is because when I have toured, and I've toured all over the world, people know the work. Even technicians backstage will say, oh, you're the guy. Oh, you're the guy. That I like that because I'm not in it so much for what I'm about. My job as a creative artist is to make things that are universal that speak to all different cultures and all different people of all different ages. And not to say, look at me, it's more about what human beings can do. And being in a skill discipline, my job is also to push the skill, push it as far as I can go and even further than that. And, and that, of anything, that's what I'm most, most proud of is that in doing the work that I've created many different, different, kinds of, different kinds of techniques, different kinds of expressions, that I've done what I thought was impossible. And then I kept working on it and brought it into the realm of being possible. Now, is it more mathematics than it is art? Uh, I would say no, but I do study a great deal of mathematics, and that's actually what I'm getting into now, is trying to take my creative process, where I did explore the histories of mathematics, physics, and many different sciences, and stu many studies in nature, and that inspired me to go after working with certain shapes, um, not copying nature, but being inspired by it. Now I'm taking that process of being a creative artist and making new things. When I performed that work, I was and am the interpretive artist. So I have two jobs. Creative artist makes the work, the interpretive artist takes it for the to the audience. Now I'm trying to do that in the learning environment by having students then explore that process. You know, we have to take a break now. We come back, I want to continue to talk about that. Yeah. We'll do that when we come back. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back right after this. Welcome back to This Is Jersey. Today our guest is juggler and performer Michael Motion, talking about his current efforts to help children think imaginatively and creatively through simple and fun tasks. So Michael, you've been spending a lot of time in schools. Tell me, how do you work with schools now? What I'm doing is I'm concentrating on the learning experience of students. I don't like to call it working in education because education, to me, has a very formalistic sort of uh, emotion to it and I like the freedom of learning the way I learn as an artist. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm trying to bring to the students. I'm trying to get the activity level of the students 
to be committed like somebody who works with skill. That is, so I'm designing interesting, new, very simple, yet very primal and mysterious skills the students have to explore to be able to access the concepts behind them, but not by demystifying them, keeping the magic, keeping the beauty, keeping the aesthetic of the human experience, not sacrificing a lot of that to simply the clarity of concept, because concept without humanity and without emotion and spirit, they might as well be in a book on a shelf. They live within us, and it's how we express ourselves with it that makes it sort of worth sharing. So what are the elements included in this? Well, like one of the things, if, if say, like I've read The Common Core, and I have distilled it down to three different things that The Common Core is trying to do, or trying to get in our students that is not happening very well. One, students don't know how to deal with unknowns. They don't know how to abstract, and they don't know how to go deep. Those are three very basic skills in learning. And different disciplines, different, different professionals have experienced it in different ways, depending on the language. The language that I'm trying to promote with students is what biological evolution has given us, which is our hands feed our brain. Our bodies feed our brain, activates our brain. So I'm giving them a lot of physical activities that are very simple, but allow them to say, use their own breath to move something. Now, is it about their breath? Is it about the boundary of them moving a ball around a ring? But it's force. Force is a very mysterious thing. Rather than just defining force in one way, let them experience it, let them have the control of that boundary. Then take that boundary and have it move. Then they're reacting. Then they're involved. So sometimes I'll work with right angles. And right angles, I'll bring in a level and have them experience what a level is and then a plumb line. And that's where we get right angles from gravity and from the horizon. So then have them explore right angles, both horizontally on a table, many of them, creating them open and closed geometric shapes, and then standing them up. Now you're getting into balance. Now you're getting into structure. These are very primal things that all civilizations have dealt with. And that's my bent, is to go simple and bring the life of concepts out that way, rather than layering too many bits of information or pieces of information one on top of each other. Let the students breathe, let them think about what they're doing. And how does this process all work? How do you start? How many days do you meet with students? Well, in the past three years, I've been meeting. Uh, the first year, I was in one school working with the fifth grade. Uh, and I met with them once a week for, uh, I think, 25 weeks. The next year, I was in two different schools in Connecticut and working with one group, one, or two groups once a week. And the other four classes, uh, I had them once a week in another school system. This year, we're doing the entire fifth grade of 12 classes for a series of six lesson plans each. So it's growing. Now, Michael, what kind of kids do you work with? I don't categorize students one way or another. I will say that in the different schools, you'll find different energies just generally in a grouping of students. There's, there are some students, one in particular I can think of in one of the classes. First two weeks, I saw her react to these exercises. I said, MIT. She should be going to MIT, there's no question. There's other students that I say, yeah, he, he could be doing this, this, this. But I'm not there to limit anybody or to, what I'm there to do is to have them experience uh, different parts of themselves, different identities of themselves. Rather than being the same person in the same grouping all the time, let them try new things. Let them collaborate. Let them then inspire. Look across. What is he doing over there? Oh, maybe I can try that. You know, have the learning environment be a building environment where the ideas are not sort of prioritized according to value of how they can then be tested. It's more the releasing of that wonderful energy to, to see four students together learn how to balance a structure and then lift it together. And then the first thing they want to do is make sure everybody knows that they did that. You know, that's you're trying to release that energy. So Michael, do you do this all yourself? The first couple of years I was doing all the designing and teaching. But because I have two jobs in my career, the creative artist creating the work and interpreting it on stage for the audience, I think the best, what we've come up with now, is that I'm creating the lesson plans and the activities and then teaching them to interpretive artists. Like now I have a man, Matt Del Rosario, who was a dancer from Palabalas. Having him go in and he's teaching. 
He learns the lesson plan from me, and then he extends the work into movement. But he's still teaching all the concepts behind it. So now that's what I'm trying to do, is get a number of really interesting, different interpretive artists and interpretive scientists and whatever that can learn these lesson plans and the activities and take them into these new worlds and inter reinterpret them so that the students have an, an interesting and different experience each time they're taught. So you've worked with the late David Bowie. Tell me about that. Yeah, I was sorry and surprised to hear that he had passed. Um, I was lucky enough to be seen by Jim Henson. Uh, actually, for a birthday party of his, they hired me to perform with Crystal Balls, and they had the script for Labyrinth, but it was an iron ball. When they saw my work, they changed it to be a Crystal Ball, and they flew me over to London to meet with David Bowie, who was going to be the star, and Jim Henson to see if I could teach him the Crystal Ball work, which was not going to happen. It was very gracious and very nice. So I ended up having to be in the costume with David Bowie and be behind him and be his arms whenever that stuff happened. And I actually had to solve a couple of problems, manipulation problems as well. So it, it was one of the coolest things ever, to work with Jim Henson and David Bowie at the same time. Yeah. What was it like to be on a movie set? Uh, lots of fun. You know why? Because they're all so good. Everybody who does their job there is just so good. Now, how are you transitioning now from the classroom to your performances? Because I, I know you still do that. Uh, I am performing, but what I'm trying to do is, as you get older when you're doing very athletic things, you either look bad doing them, or you try to do, you teach it to younger people, or you try to mature your creative process. I'm trying to mature my creative process, take that which I have performed, and incorporate it with the learning tools that I'm developing in schools, to take that to an audience, not so much as an instruction, but as a celebration of learning from an artistic standpoint. Because what I'm doing is, in the schools, I'm trying to have the students be the interpretive artists of the activities, and therefore the creative artists of their own learning process. That's what I'm going to be doing with audiences as well. And you do that with older people then? Yeah. yeah. And, and what is that like? Tell me about the process. You bring people up and have them do things you're doing? Yes, but I also have audience members in their seats do things. Um, it's very interactive and it's, it's a celebration of communion, experience, a communal experience, being together and sharing both our fears and our challenges with trying to do something we can't do, but it's fun. Very good. Well, thank you so much for being on our show. Good luck and we'll see you at NJCU. Thank you for joining us for this edition of This is Jersey. We'll see you again next time.